Hey guys, my name is Annie and welcome to my channel, 10 to Life, where I am bringing you full true crime cases in under 10 minutes. Full cases, start to finish, but only what you want to hear. None of the boring storylines or the empty plots, just the key facts, the most insane details, and all the unexpected stuff we know happens along the way. I'm coming to you directly from my apartment here in Brooklyn, New York, which if you're watching the video version of this on my YouTube channel, you can see beautiful New York behind me. And if you're listening to the podcast version of this, but you want to check out the video version, feel free to head over to my YouTube channel. If you guys like what you hear, please like, comment, share, review, and don't forget to subscribe by clicking that subscribe button below. If you have any case recommendations, send them my way. I would love to hear them. And don't forget to follow me on social at underscore Annie Elise. So let's get into the case. Hey guys, welcome back. So as you can see, I am back in New York, which is so nice to be home, but it's also so hot here right now. I literally went to the grocery store this morning at 9 a.m. and it was already 92 degrees and I was sweating bullets. So it's nice to be back, but it's also really freaking hot. Um, anyways, the case we're going to be discussing today is actually a current ongoing case that's in the news a lot right now, and a lot of you have been requesting that I cover this case. So that's what I'm doing. I'm going to give you all of the newest updates and break down the case for you from start to finish. So let's jump right into the case. Just a couple of weeks ago, on July 10th at 8.30 a.m., 29-year-old Howard Jansen III walked into the Kansas City Police Department to report his three-year-old daughter, Olivia Jansen, is missing. And to give you a little bit of a background on Howard and his daughter, Olivia, Howard is no longer with Olivia's biological mother, Whitney. Whitney's currently in custody on a hit-and-run charge, and Howard is now engaged to another woman named Jackie Kirkpatrick, oh my gosh, say that three times fast, who's 33 years old. And Jackie is a mother to three other children, and her partner was actually previously shot to death. His name was Johnny Lee, and he was shot and killed in 2009. In Johnny's murder, prosecutors declined to file charges against anybody because they said that the shooter had shot in self-defense, but then later the shooter was actually convicted of a quadruple homicide. Olivia is Howard's only biological child, and he actually, in fact, has a tattoo of her name on his face above his eyebrow. And so when he and Jackie met, it was the perfect blended family. She had her children, he had Olivia. They would often post pictures together on social media of the kids, of the two parents. It really was a happy blend family. And although they posted so many pictures of the family interacting together on social media, the parents both primarily posted photos of each other on social media. Both of their pages were filled with romantic, super gushy posts about each other, how much they loved each other, how they found their soulmate, how they were so excited to get married. They even actually referred to each other as husband and wife, even though technically they weren't married yet. But they were just so madly in love. And you can see by some of these posts, it was just, I mean, kind of in my opinion, a little over the top. I mean, I'm all for love, but it seemed a little bit excessive. They also shared joint Snapchat accounts with each other and just really were displaying their affection and their love for the entire world to see. They had met their soulmates and they were so happy and they were going to move forward, get married, and have this amazing blended family. When Howard went into the police station that morning to report Olivia missing, he said that he woke up at 5.30 that morning, went into Olivia's room, didn't see her, and noticed that the front door was open, which was very concerning. He also says that he hadn't seen her since he put her to bed at 11 p.m. the night before. But what strikes me as odd is he also tells police that he waited for three hours to report her as missing, which maybe he was just trying to search the house, the backyard, call a few family friends, see if she could have been picked up or what maybe could have been going on. But to not report your three-year-old as missing for up to three hours seems a little bit of a red flag to me. An Amber Alert was immediately issued in the search for Olivia, and it states that she was last seen wearing a pink or purple top, teal pajama bottoms, and a ponytail in her hair. And they had everybody out there searching for her. They had drones, they had canines, they had people on foot. I mean, the search for Olivia started very quickly, and it went rampant. They were exhausting all of their options to find this little girl. This three foot tall, 50 pound, brown hair, blue green eye little girl. After reporting Olivia is missing to the police, Howard makes a phone call to his father and his stepmother to let them know that Olivia is missing. And they report that he was completely distressed and just screaming, the baby's gone, the baby's gone, the baby's missing. But again, that's another thing that strikes me as odd because at that point, that's complete disassociation. If you're telling family members or anybody that your child's missing, why are you referring to them as the baby? Why wouldn't you say, Olivia's missing? Oh my God, have you seen Olivia? I can't find Olivia. Not, the baby is missing, the baby is gone. In my opinion, from this report, at that point, he was already trying to detach from Olivia. But I don't know, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm looking into it. 
As the search picks up and continues, Jackie, Howard's 33-year-old fiance, refuses to allow police to search her car. Okay, nope, that's another red flag. So now we've already got three red flags under our belt here. There's something going on. Just a few short hours later, nine blocks from Olivia's house, the search was called off because they found her remains buried in a shallow grave. Reports say that when they recovered Olivia's body, she had several bruises on her face and appeared to have been badly beaten. Where they discovered her body was nearby a walking trail, so it's unclear how she was killed, it's unclear how she got there. At this point, they don't have any immediate suspects. All they know is that they have identified this little girl, they found her, and she unfortunately is deceased. As the reports begin rolling in, Olivia's grandparents speak, and they share their frustration because they say that they had reached out to the Kansas City Department for Families and Children several times on Olivia's behalf, trying to express concern, and that essentially nothing was followed up on in a thorough way. The concern initially sparked on June 19th when they noticed a Facebook post from Jackie, Howard's fiance, saying she wanted to kill herself. And she reports telling DCF, I'm scared. This woman puts on Facebook that she wants to kill herself. She's taking care of my grandchild. I haven't seen my grandchild since March. I'm concerned. She clearly isn't well and shouldn't be watching our grandchild. Police records do show that officers did respond that day she made that call to Howard and Jackie's house to do an investigation into the suicide. And nothing came of it, so they left. But that was just one of six calls since the start of 2020 that were made to that house. Which is another red flag. I mean, I really need to have like a little monitor down here that just goes bing, 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 so we can tally up the amount of red flags that are going on in this case. And all of those calls varied in terms of some were for welfare checks, some were in related to suspected child abuse, but it was still unclear how many of those calls directly involved Olivia or if they strictly involved Jackie's biological children. And Olivia's grandmother goes on to say that oftentimes when they would take Olivia home after spending time with them, she would often be in distress and not want to go home. She says that Olivia was always unhappy to go home and would often voice that even to her grandmother. And this breaks my heart, but the grandmother reports Olivia would look at her frowning and say, you love me? You're mad at me? Why are you making me go back? Can I come back? Can I come back? It's so sad. Like, and as a parent or as a grandmother, like imagine seeing a three-year-old just looking at you, not understanding why you're sending them away, sad that you're sending them away and asking already before they've even left, can they come back to you? Olivia's grandparents also describe both Howard and Jackie as drug addicts, which, ding, another red flag. But their real concern stems with all of these DCF calls, and we've seen this so much even in the Gabriel Fernandez case, how there's something broken fundamentally in the system, which is an entire different conversation. But she says that her frustration stemmed because they didn't really do anything. She says they would say that they'd follow up, but nothing ever got done. And she didn't know what else she could do at this point. She was expressing concern, she was worried, but what more could she do? And it got so bad that she said all they would do was knock on the door and that one time on June 22nd, she was on the phone with them for 23 minutes trying to tell them everything she could possibly think of, letting them know anything she's heard from Olivia, anything she's witnessed, just all of her concerns that have been really piling up since seeing her last time in March. And then she says, they sent me an email that says I can send them more stuff and I can tell them more things, but that they want her to know they won't be contacting her. I mean, what? There's a three-year-old child involved in this and other children involved in this. What are you talking about? On Friday night, the day that Olivia was not only reported missing, but the day that Olivia was actually found, Howard was arrested. And just two days later on Sunday morning, Jackie, his fiance, was also arrested. Initially, they were both booked on suspicion of first-degree murder, but then Sunday night, the charges were actually filed and released. And the county DA said that both Jackie and Howard had been charged with first-degree murder, aggravated child endangerment, and criminal desecration of a corpse. Olivia's grandmother spoke out again and said, I'm glad it's first degree murder, but I wish it would have been capital murder. It needs to be more. I want them to pay for what they did. This has been going on for months and it really didn't have to. And I agree with her. This is something that, whether it was the system failing or of course Olivia's parents failing, something was broken here and something was going on for several months that ultimately led to her murder that could have possibly been prevented. So unfortunately now at this point, we know Olivia is no longer missing, that she in fact has been murdered. And we know that the two suspects, her father and his fiance have been arrested and charged with her murder. But why? Why the murder? What took place? What made all of this happen when you guys have been posting how in love you are, how happy you are, how your family is one big happy family? What went wrong? 
A source went to the police and shared some information that they had, and they said that they stayed over at the couple's house and actually witnessed them feeding Olivia soap, so much so and so bad to where she started throwing up. And the source goes on to say that when they put all of the other kids to bed, Olivia didn't want to go to bed. So they wrapped her up in a padded blanket, like a moving blanket, put duct tape all around that blanket, then put tote bags, heavy tote bags, surrounding the rolled up blanket so that she couldn't get out. Um, that's not a way to get your child to go to sleep unless you're literally trying to kill them. The source says that when he woke up the next morning, Olivia was gone. So is this when she died? Had, did they do this technique of sleep training or whatever you would call it often to where now the abuse has gone too far and it's actually turned into murder? Also, how long has Olivia been dead? Her grandparents reported as not seeing her since March. So did she die earlier and then she was just recently disposed of? There's so many unanswered questions. And my biggest question is, why didn't this source report something the second they witnessed it happening? Why would you wait until a body is discovered? Why wouldn't you call the police immediately or put a stop to it yourself? You're literally witnessing child abuse and not doing anything. In my opinion, you are just as guilty as whoever was abusing the child or whoever murdered the child because you didn't do anything to stop it. There's other reports that say there were holes on the walls in the house and a source says that they would take Olivia, and this kills me, they would take Olivia and bounce her off the walls, creating these holes in the house and that they wouldn't allow Olivia to eat because Jackie said the food stamps that they lived off of were for her kids. Is that why they fed her soap? Because they weren't giving her real food? Were they giving her the soap because she was bad? I mean, this is abuse, 100%, torture, 100%. And again, let's go back to all these little red flags that are popping up, which now this whole entire video should be filled with them. It's also been reported that Jackie's nephew was staying with the couple in the days leading up to Olivia's suspected murder and the day of her disappearance. And reports say on the morning of July 10th, when Olivia was first reported missing, that there is camera footage that shows Jackie pulling into the driveway backing into her driveway really far in at 6.48 a.m. And that her nephew, who I'm gonna leave his name out of this because he's a minor, was also seen helping her, cutting through the neighbor's yard on foot, and that Howard is on this footage as well. And then Jackie and Howard leave at 7.15 a.m. for exactly 34 minutes, which is currently being suspected as the time frame they left and went to bury Olivia's body. They return at 7.49 a.m., quickly change clothes, and then you can see Howard leave the house again, which is when he went to the police station to report Olivia as missing. His whole story of waking up that morning at 5.30 a.m. and not seeing Olivia and the front door being open was complete bullshit. I mean, maybe he did wake up at 5.30 that morning and he noticed that they had suffocated her in that blanket and she was dead. And at 6.48, when Jackie's seen backing into the driveway, they're loading Olivia into the car and then they're seen taking her and burying her. And then they come back 34 minutes later and then he leaves just 30 minutes later to go to the police station and report her missing. Maybe that timeline of when he really did discover that Olivia was dead was 5 30 a.m. Maybe that's true but the rest of the story, the front door being open, him not knowing where she could have gone, if somebody had stolen her, that was complete bullshit. We now know that when Olivia's body was discovered there are reports that she had bruises on her face and appears to have been badly beaten. Was she beaten before being put in this blanket? Was the blanket actually what killed her? Because we still don't have the cause of death at this time. But was that the moment and the instance that killed her? Or was that just one incident in a long string of a continued abuse and torture? There were virtually no posts of Olivia on either one of their social media channels after May 28th. So could she have died earlier and they've been concealing her body? Is this something that just happened as a fluke because it was abuse gone too far? There are so many unanswered questions, not only the cause of death, but what events led to this murder? What was happening behind closed doors this entire time and why wasn't something done about it? It's unclear whether Howard or Jackie have entered pleas and it's also unclear if they've retained attorneys who would speak on their behalf and announce those pleas. This case immediately took the media by storm and so many people felt emotionally invested in this case. Some people who had helped with the search party initially earlier that morning and into that afternoon. Some people who are just hearing about it on social media and through different media outlets. But this case really tugged at everybody's heartstrings, so much so that there was such an outpouring of love and support and people who wanted to go and pay their respect at Olivia's funeral service to just let the extended family know and let poor Olivia know how loved she is. Just one week after her body being discovered, she was laid to rest with hundreds of people in attendance. The crowd gathered around her little white casket, wrote little notes on her casket. Sorry, this is like just heartbreaking. They all wore yellow, which was Olivia's favorite color. 
and one of the guests in attendance was her mother, Whitney. The courts allowed her release to go to her funeral to pay her respects and grieve her little three-year-old daughter. And she is expected on these unrelated charges to be released in December 2020. And I can't even imagine the turmoil going on inside of her and the guilt she must feel for not being out, even though she made a mistake. Yes, she's acknowledged that mistake with the hit and run, but as a parent to be struggling internally with wondering if I was out, could I have prevented this? It's just the grief and the actual just complete heartbreak that she must be experiencing while locked away for this unrelated charge. I can't even imagine what she must be going through. And I'm so happy that the courts were forgiving and allowed her to at least have temporary release to be at her daughter's funeral service and say her goodbyes. And I know that that may be not be the popular opinion and other people may not agree with that, but the human inside of me thinks that that was a great choice on the court's behalf. Here we are again talking about not only remains being found of a little girl, but ongoing child abuse that is suspected to have been happening. DCF failing a child once again, and I understand the system is broken. There aren't enough people who go into this line of work to begin with, so it's hard to follow up on the extensive caseload that somebody may have. But we've got to come together and figure out a way, myself included, how can we prevent this from happening again? How can we do something small to prevent this from happening again? Whether it is more people going into that line of work or more people following up, more people as witnesses. When you see something, say something, because if DCF isn't gonna follow up, if they don't have enough time to do it, then it's our responsibility if we see something, we need to bring it to somebody's attention other than just DCF, to the police, to the family, to whoever we possibly can, because if we don't, who knows how long it's gonna be pushed under the rug until something like this then goes from abuse to murder. And again, we've seen it time and time again in so many cases, and it is such an unfortunate tragedy that really doesn't even need to happen. We can prevent it, so we've gotta start doing that and we've gotta be better. As I continue to hear updates regarding Howard and Jackie's pleas and their arraignments and what goes on when they go to trial, I will keep you updated. Hopefully they get the absolute maximum penalty possible. And I am just, my heart is breaking for Olivia's mother, Whitney, and for your grandparents. I am so sorry that you guys have to be going through this right now and that you're experiencing this. I know the entire community and world is praying for you. You're in our thoughts. And although that will never bring Olivia back, I hope you are able to take a small piece of solace in knowing that. Thanks so much for listening to this case with me, you guys. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe by hitting that subscribe button below. And as always, if you enjoyed it, please like, comment, review, and share. Let's continue to bring awareness to these cases and speak on the victim's behalf. So until the next case, stay safe.